we're off to Pontypool in the Gwent Valley for your century. Located in the Shuid Valley of central Monmouthshire, Pontypool had a history of iron production from medieval times. The long-established iron masters, the Hanburys, put Pontypool on the map when in 1703 the first tin plate rolling mill was opened. This innovation helped another burgeoning industry, Japanware, the ancient art of decorating and varnishing tableware. By 1725, Japanning tin plate was the chief industry of the town. A small industrial and market town, Pontypool was served by a canal from 1792 and it grew and prospered with the coming of the railways in 1854. Situated at the eastern end of the South Wales coalfield, it became the commercial frontier town serving the Eastern Valley. By 1900, its surviving ironworks were producing sheet steel. And such was the buoyancy of the coalfield economy that Pontypool was a town of considerable prosperity. By the beginning of the 20th century, Pontypool's population had swollen to 32,000. Workers arrived from all over the country, induced by the high wages in the steelworks and outlying coal mines. Local men too, like Flossie's father and brothers, spent all their working lives underground. She remembers preparing their tommy bags. I used to put them ready for the morning, clean bag, and their clothes clothes that we put on the chair in front of the fire for them for the morning, put on, they come home black. It was hard grind, but Flossie made a much needed contribution to the housekeeping. And you go to, go to local people washing, our friends and that, and to do cleaning, clean the house through a day for a shilling. 80 trains a day now fed the town's four railway stations. Many people came in search of work. One result was a tidal wave of evangelism spreading up the eastern valleys. Originally, I mean, Welsh was a natural um, language that was used in the, in the services. But gradually, as you had people coming in from Somerset, from Birmingham, working on the railways, um, from all parts of England and indeed Ireland, um, it became anglicised, really. And you had... If, it, if a particular chapel could not cope with that, they built another one up the road. The Hanbury family had lived in Pontypool Park since the 1680s. John Capel Hanbury, the last squire, greatly improved the town's social and civic life at the beginning of the century. Amongst uh, John Capel Hanbury's many gifts to the area, really, were that he donated the sites for Pontypool and District Hospital, Jones West Monmouth School for Boys, the market and the library. Opened in 1898, Jones's West Monmouth Public School built a reputation for excellence throughout Wales. Caleb Council's parents hoped their son would go there. When I was 11, I passed the entrance exam from Pontymoyle School to attend there. But the fee was two guineas. At the beginning of term, I had to take two pounds, two shillings. Most children had to leave school at 14, with many going to work in the various steel and galvanising works. Panteg, just south of the town, was one steelworks run by two former managers, Wright and Butler. In 1902, Panteg merged with a Midlands firm, forming Baldwins Limited. These works nurtured many talented sportsmen. Rugby too sort of embodies sort of uh, elements such as courage, manliness, um, and above all, discipline and teamwork. And those were the hallmarks of what I would call the naturally hard men who worked in the steelworks and, and uh, the collieries. The three Jones brothers were rugby heroes in 1914, becoming the unofficial Welsh champions for the first time in the club's 46-year history. Tian Jones was one of many young men who left Pontypool to fight in the Great War. Park Terrace in those days had an iron railings which was overlooking Crane Street Station. 
and I was holding Mam's hand, and she said, all those men there in khaki are soldiers going off to war. It wasn't long before Caleb's own father was called up and fighting somewhere in France. He said, if you want to know where I am, the name of the place is very similar to the man's name who's in the lodge at Westmont School. Now, we knew that the man who lived in Westmont School Lodge, but his name was Harris. So Mum said, oh, aye, there it is on the map, Harris. Over 150 men from Pontypool perished, but the war did stimulate change. In 1920, John Cable Hanbury donated Pontypool Park to the town. My father told me that when he was a lad, you weren't allowed into the park, really. You could look over the gates, and it was uh, only permitted for the public to go in there on high days and bank holidays. The town's spirit was lifted still further when the rugby team had another wonderful season in 1921. The new public park played host to many other social occasions. Gwyneth Evans remembers the festival held there every August. There was an old... Uh band in Pontnewin. It was quite hilarious to see those. They were then employed uh, young men that used to be in this jazz band mm -hmm. and uh, they used to jazz it all up too and we loved every bit of it. A new town bridge was opened in 1924 marking the arrival of the Nationalist Stethvod. The Prince of Wales visited but it was the old traditions that stuck in some people's minds. My aunt, she had uh, this man there and I used to think, well, why is he wearing all those robes? Uh, he was part of the gossip ceremony. And uh, he lodged with my aunt, although we weren't Welsh-speaking. But it was a time when jobs were hard to secure for young men, and every trick in the book had to be applied. Attending a particular church or chapel usually put you in a favourable position. Caleb remembers T.B. Pearson, a member of Trevethin Church. He was also the chairman or something to do with Pontypool Gas and Water Company. And I remember walking along town one day and this lorry with a lot of workmen in the back was going by and uh, somebody said to me, hey Caleb, is that Trevethin Church out in? He said, or oh, is it Mr Pearson's workforce? After working at Tepenta's Pit on the coal lorries, Jimmy Chatham decided he wanted to learn a trade. Fortunately, his father, originally from Staffordshire, was a furnace man in Pontnewenydd Works. Dad, can you give me a job in the forge? You don't want to go in there. <laughs> you stay where you are. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I said, I'm finishing up there, I said. And when I explained it to him, oh, that was different. The mill, man, uh, mill manager in there then was another Staffordshire man, Len Summers. And uh, there was no problem in getting in there. For the boys who decided to go underground, conditions at Tepentus Pit were difficult. The presence of pit beetles didn't help. These black pats now, Red Indians they used to call them, they stick on your neck, they're crawling all over you, you know. They wouldn't bite you, they just go for the moisture on your skin. And I thought to myself, <laughs> I wonder how long I'm going to last year. Disputes over falling wages led to a general strike. In August 1926, Arthur Jenkins, a local miners' agent, led 600 colliers up to the quarry level to persuade any blacklegs to down tools. Events turned nasty and police reinforcements were called. Truncheons were drawn and it descended into a full-blown riot, as Jimmy remembers. They were rough. And Harry Merchant up here, he had a clout in the head. They reckon it was the police. Fractured skull. Arthur Jenkins was jailed for three months for inciting to riot. A sense of distrust hung in the air, and unionists like Gwyneth's father, a Pontnewenid steelworker, had meetings in secret. On the Sunday morning, they had a trade union meeting in uh, uh, Pontnewenid, up on the hill, and uh, he used to take me, because I, then the people wouldn't know where he was going if he was taking me, so I was the shield. By the 30s, many had been without work for years, but Pontypool had plenty of wonderful shops and places of entertainment. The town's first cinema, built in Crane Street in 1914, was now the infamous Palais de Danse. 
Once a month, we'd have a big band there. Billy Cotton, Geraldo, Ivy Benson, they all been to the Pali and it's out of this world. The floor would actually go up and down, it's spring. If you couldn't dance, you sat on the side and you'd go up and down like that. There was also Pont Nguyen's Pavilion and the Theatre Royal on Osborne Road. It seated 800 people and was run by a great local character. George Henry Pitt was the, well he was the owner I think as well as the manager and you can never forget him because for every performance, the beginning and the end, he would appear on the stage and he'd say something that was on and then he'd say, I remain yours sincerely, George Henry Pitt. And of course, when he was saying George Henry Pitt, all the wags in the audience would say it with him. Unemployment was now running at an all-time high in the Eastern Valley, and so in 1937, the education settlement was opened by Lord Macmillan to retrain unemployed miners. By 1938, factories like Pilkington's Glass and Girlings were being wooed to the area to alleviate the problem. Panteg Steelworks began to specialise in certain steels, steels that were soon to be used for a massive war effort. this top shelf consultants two million bucks pure strategic thinking could put us years ahead the board is psyched I'm psyched it's a brilliant plan one question given our current technology is this implementable no no no, no. 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 strategies you could actually execute no now there's a plan still psyched does Barry need a new image? Yeah! You know, well-loved television presenter Barry Welsh. Barry, yes. that's something on your face. He was a bit like the elephant man and a bit like a person from the ring. Oh, no, it is your face. Barry Welsh is coming, Friday, 10.50, ITV1. With the war gaining momentum and nearby places like Newport suffering from heavy bombing, Pontypool was a relative haven in comparison. As men left to fight overseas, it was the women who experienced a role reversal. On the outskirts of Pontypool, the Royal Ordnance Survey factory at Glascoid employed 3,000 and was a highly sensitive place. We lost the inside bus one night and we were walking around half a dozen of us and somebody said, stop or who goes there? And we were frightened to death. It was because, you know, all black, of course, because of the blackout. And somebody put a light on, and there were these soldiers with bayonets. Good God, they frightened the life out of us. I was sure they, was, they were Germans. With the Luftwaffe searching for military targets, in July 1940, the MOD ordered the destruction of the Folly Tower, a landmark above Pontypool. Great care was taken to prevent light seeping from the open hearth furnaces in the town's steelworks, but there was one isolated incident that was too close to call. A lone German bomber dropped a stray medium calibre bomb on Market Street, partly demolishing the Wheatsheaf public house. Now, the very resourceful landlord, who had a narrow escape, as you might imagine, turned this to his advantage. He charged passers-by for the privilege of inspecting the bomb damage and then put the proceeds to the War Comforts Fund. Many coal and steel workers stayed at home as their work was deemed a crucial part of the war effort. We had one order there, you see. 14 gauge, 8 foot, 3 foot wide, but it was corrugated after and shaped, they had a shape, it, a bender, what they call, for the Anderson shelters. Indeed, orders were such that many local women were called into the works, replacing the men. 
Victor Williams, he had to go. And he was driving the one gantry on the, on the billet bay. And I used to go up in that with him and learn to drive. And then I went on to the billet bay with the Foster's boys. And then they taught me to drive this scissors uh, gantry. It was a, a bit of a shock to see some of them in there, you know, but uh, they were doing a good job. Oh, yes. Many evacuees arrived from London and there was a military presence on the polo ground and at New Inn. Sadly, over 600 men were lost to the town, but many did return at the end of the war, some expecting their old jobs back from the women in the works. One woman came down. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Who was, uh, in a man's language, responsible for this? She had a notice. <laughs> oh, I, I. She didn't peel any eggs at all. <laughs> Bump. <laughs> Immediately after the war, poor housing was replaced by new council estates at Trevethin and Penagarden. Life in the steelworks still felt timeless to some. Richie remembers taking packed lunches to his relatives, as had been the case for generations. My grandfather worked in the foundry department, and uh, my mother took his sandwiches in, and I can remember going with her. And then we walked down through the factory uh, to where the furnaces were, and my father was actually working on the furnaces, and we gave him his food as well. The north end of the furnace bay was open, you know, you could stand at the north end and you could look down through and you could see the, the hive of activity in there. Uh, you could see the hot metal being, uh, being cast into uh, ingots and, uh, yeah, it was, it was fairly open, uh, there were no closed doors. But there was an urgency to attract new factories. In 1948, British Nylon Spinners was opened at Mamhalid to produce the new wonder fabric, Nylon. A new development, Cumbran, appeared with the passing of the New Towns Act in 1948. And in rugby, selectors looked to schools for new talent. I had no idea of rugby, but apparently to them, I had a good pair of hands and I, I could catch anything or everything that came to me. Together with the newly built stadium, there was no shortage of inspiration for young players. Great teams such as the Springboks played Pontypool and Newbridge in 1951. And there was always Pontypool United, a flourishing feeder club for the Pontypool side. A stepping stone for many, as Ray Prosser remembers. There was a vacancy in the Pontypool side down here in the forwards. And uh, this uh, Digger Stanley, he came down, and, uh, knowing he was an old uh, player than me, he wasn't going to have a again, but he come down to keep me company because I didn't have enough guts to go down there uh, on my own, you know, on the trail. This way, many young players realised their dreams. Benny Jones was successfully selected to play for Wales under-14s and under-18s. By the summer of 1958, he was captaining Pontypool and remembers coming up against some top-class teams. We played at that. They were, they were full of internationals. We had two internationals, Alan Forward and Pross throwing the ball about from everywhere, running through. We just took them apart. Making them unofficial Welsh champions for the fourth time. For hand rolling mills like Pont Nwenydd, it was a different story. They produced sheet steel, which the new works at Llanwern could make on a fantastic scale. You couldn't compete with Oslo. Why, why in the end? You, you, you could see it coming. Sooner or later, we'd have to close. And so it was the end of the road for many in December 1961. It is only the very young ones that could get in places, see? There was lots and lots of men that never worked after that. The face of the town began to change beyond all recognition. Pontypool's College of Further Education opened in 58 and Llandegveth Reservoir in 1961. Beeching closed the Eastern Valleys line in April 1962 and the station at Crane Street in 1966. George Street, a renowned bottleneck, was widened and further demolition occurred over the years along Crane Street. The town's tin plate forges closed one by one and the demolition of the bar mill signalled the end for the open hearth furnace men. I think he was aware that the open hearth furnaces only had a limited lifespan and uh, he wanted to protect his employment and his young family, I suppose, at that time. And uh, he jumped before it actually happened. I took a job down at Llanwyn uh, 
obviously when it first started, yeah. Mines were closing and local MP Leo Absey attended demonstrations in Cardiff protesting about the lack of alternative employment. Miners at Blind Sachan even ran the coal line themselves to prevent its closure. New high-tech industries helped. During its heyday, British nylon spinners employed 7,000 people. The heart of the town was the rugby club and the leisure centre. The stars, the Pontypool front row. The club spun around Cobbler, who was captain of the club, and for 10 seasons, it was based on a good front row, and the pack went well, and, and then, the, of course, the backs weren't a running type of backs at that particular period, but they were backs that could defend like the clappers of hell. And the following was huge. Green players, Bobby Windsor, Charlie Fortner, Eddie Butler, Jeff Squires, Steve Sutton, Mark Brown. You can just go on, can't you? Just go on and on and on. Anyway, I think it was good, I mean, for the people of my generation and when I grew up, like, it was just... You had some, your town had some, didn't it, what other towns did now. By the 80s, there was a whole raft of wins. Welsh champions three times, Whitbread champions four times, and perhaps most importantly, the Schweppes Cup win of 1983, where they beat Swansea in the finals. By now, Cumbran New Town was well established and attracted workers of a younger generation. I lived in Cumbran for a while, and it was totally different. You know, and you would come back, like, it's the roots there, it's people, like, people are so friendly around here. By the mid-80s, the old industries employed a fraction of what they had 50 years previously. Blind Sachan was the last remaining pit in the valley. Royston Wilmot was one of the last apprentices. I started with a very good friend of the family, and he showed me the ropes on my first ever job underground. And uh, it was a good time working with Glyn and Barney and the Gunter brothers, <laughs> but good people to work with. Finally, even this mine succumbed in 1985. It was a sad day for this valley and every other valley when the mines closed because I believe national industries like the coal industry and the steel industries made communities. For Steve and Royston's generation, there were only a few options. Most of them went on the buildings. I went into bus driving because that was like the main jobs, like either buildings, bus driving, or you could the chicken factory. There's only temporary contracts. I mean, you could be there one week and have a notice the next. The bypass built in 1992 made Pontypool more accessible, but the centre itself had long been at a low ebb. We used to go window shopping on Sunday evening, you know, just to see the, how lovely the shops was dressed up. as none of that today, so I boarded up. Oh, they used to have some nice shops in Ponty. The future looks uncertain, with even the few remaining high-tech industries gradually scaling down or relocating abroad. However, the Folly Tower was restored and commemorated by the Prince of Wales in 1994, as was the Grotto in 1998. With World Heritage status awarded further up the Eastern Valley, the town may have turned the corner. There is a lot of heritage throughout this valley, I think, and if it was opened up, the heritage throughout the valley, a lot more heritage it would bring in more tourism. The town over the last few years has bottomed out and the only way is up. The future has to be a rosy one. It's a pleasant market town and one that I'm proud to call home. Pontypool's growth was the result of its industrial innovations. But in the course of the 20th century, its surplus of tin plate works has been run down and its steelworks have been forced to adapt or die. The town's spirit and its rugby endeavours have outlasted its industry, but the establishment of a new town on its very doorstep has been one blow to many. But after many years of neglect, Pontypool has now got a new vigour and is seeking to celebrate its heritage with Pontypool Park as the jewel in the crown. And your century returns here on HTV next Tuesday at the same time, 7.30. Next tonight, who wants to be a millionaire?